Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jeff, for leading us in the Lord's Supper. And if you could, go ahead and turn to the book of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. And we'll continue with the story of Nicodemus. Uh, last time, uh, of course, we had uh, our Easter service, but before that, we were in the book of John, chapter 3, and ending of, of chapter 2 and on into chapter 3, uh, went through verse 13. And uh, Nicodemus had come to Jesus at night, uh, apparently... There, there, there's a little, we don't know exactly, but it does look like this was kind of a secretive meeting at night because if we find out that he is a teacher, the teacher of the Israelites, so he's, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, he's a teacher of the Jews, and we also see that the rest of the Sanhedrin, of course, did not like Jesus. How do we know that, right? Uh, they're the ones that put him to death. But also they had been trying to seek his death for a long time, but not Nicodemus. Uh, and in fact, we, we found out that Nicodemus, at the end of the book of John, you kind of have these kind of bookmarkish type things there with Nicodemus. You have Nicodemus, who is not yet a believer, but he's at least come to Jesus at night, asking a few questions, kind of probing. Uh, but at the end of the book of John, who comes for the body of Jesus? Not his disciples, but Nicodemus. And he comes in broad daylight, unashamed, unafraid, and boldly collects the body of Jesus for burial. So, wonderful story of uh, Nicodemus, but we're, start, we're not that far yet. Right now, Nicodemus has come to Jesus, and he uh, at least acknowledges that Jesus is from God. Why does he acknowledge that Jesus is from God? Because Jesus is performing signs, and these signs are from God. We often use the word miracles instead of signs, and that's fine. Uh, John properly uses the word sign, though, for this. It is a sign from God, just like a stop sign, as we covered last time. You're, what are you supposed to do when you get to that sign? Uh, some of you do, some of you don't. But you're supposed to obey that and see that sign that is there. And so it is when God sends signs, it, it means something. And there, Jesus was performing supernatural signs. This validated the message of, of Jesus, and it also authenticated his ministry. I mean, who else can do these things? These are supernatural, beyond nature. God is empowering him. So Nicodemus did see those things. Um, he, uh, Jesus immediately changes the conversation, though, to being born again. And, how, and Nicodemus is perplexed. How can such a thing happen, right? And he says, you cannot even see the kingdom of God, Jesus says, unless you are born again. And so then Jesus unfolds the mystery of what it is to be born again. And that is a sovereign work of God. And this goes opposite of Nicodemus and the Pharisees that had developed a righteousness of their own, that had developed a works-based type salvation, and so Jesus removes it completely from man manipulating God for salvation, and he puts it all on God, that God is sovereign over salvation. He is sovereign over those who are born again, that regeneration process. God is sovereign over all of that and does not need man's counsel in that process. Now, if you would, let's go over to uh, uh, verse 14, and we'll begin today. Let me turn my mic down just a little bit back there. I'm getting a little feedback. John uh, chapter 3, verse 14. Let's begin there. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his own Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people have loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together, together as the local body of Christ, to, to take of the Lord's Supper, to remind ourselves of the blood and the sacrifice that, that, that you have sent your Son, who is God in the flesh, to live, to die for our sins, 
so that our sins might be removed and the wrath has been taken upon him, the curse is on him, and that we are given his righteousness, that that beautiful atonement has taken place and that we who believe and can rest in that assurance of salvation, we can rest today knowing that we are not condemned and we can rest knowing that we have eternal life. We thank you that we can know that we indeed have been saved, saved from our sins, saved from the wrath that they deserved, saved from the, saved from the curse. And we thank you for that great salvation, Lord. As we explore this further today, uh, may our faith be strengthened as we look to the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, who has brought such a great salvation. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you would, uh, look back at verse 14. Uh, we are going to be covering verse 16, which is obviously, it has been the, you know, people say it is the most quoted uh, Bible verse in the Bible, it is the most well-known Bible verse in the Bible as well, but very few people have memorized verse 14 and 15 with 16. Uh, and if you look, you'll kind of see why, because it would be kind of uh, unusual, kind of awkward. Verse 16 is very kind of easier to, to take in. But we have to see that 16 is connected to 15, and 15 is connected to 14. And when we read things in context, uh, it, it, it makes more sense. And so right away, we begin in verse 14 uh, with this, this uh, mention of serpents, a mention of a snake, right? Look at 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So this is an odd comparison for us if we don't know the story. Uh, the lamb, all right, we, we use that lamb a lot. Like Jesus is the lamb of God. Uh, and that one makes a lot of sense. It's easy for us to grasp. We see the lamb typology played out and fulfilled. It's, it's a very easy one. But here you have another typology, and we'll get to explain that more in just a moment, that Jesus is the snake. And uh, that's an unusual typology that it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. But we're going to dig in and see why Jesus says that like the snake, that he's making a comparison there to this snake, to this serpent. And uh, let's explore that. So to get back to the original story, go to Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. And this is the analogy, this is the type, the shadow that Jesus points out that he, he says of himself, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So let's go back to that story. It's not a very lengthy story. You've probably read over it many times. Some of you, it's familiar to, uh, to you. Others, it may not be. But let's look at this kind of a brief, kind of an obscure passage that may not stick out in your mind that well. But look at verse 4, Numbers 21, verses 4, and let's read through verse 9. From Mount Or, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent uh, bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, interesting passage, obviously. So why would Jesus draw from this seemingly obscure incident to teach Nicodemus, remember that's what he's doing here, to teach Nicodemus about being born again and entering into the kingdom of God? Why would he bring up the snake, the serpents, the, 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 this, this story back in Moses' history? And this is, it's important to kind of connect these dots, but this reference to this story of the snake is used by Jesus primarily to teach the exclusivity of God's object of salvation. All right, wrap your mind around that. Jesus is drawing from this point, this historical, factual event that happened there with Israel. God sent the fiery serpents, poisons coursing through people's veins, 
and they are going to die unless they look to God's object of salvation that he has provided on a stick for them to look at, and they will be healed. Now, God gave the snake-bitten Israelites how many objects of salvation to save them from the poisonous snakes? Uh, only one, right? Now, if the Israelites said, you know what? I don't want to look at that. I will not. I'm going to take care of this myself. What would happen to them? They would die. If they said, you know what, I don't want to listen to the words of Moses that he has received from God. I don't want to look at this fiery serpent, bronze serpent there in the middle of everyone. I'm going to look elsewhere. What would happen to them? They would die, all right? So there is exclusive. God has provided them one method to be saved from the poison coursing through their veins so that they will not die. And that's what we're going to see that Jesus is pointing to here. He's pointing to a greater poison that all humanity has been infected with. And it's not from a snake bite. It is from poison. It is sin that everyone has in them. How can we be saved from this eternal damnation? How can we be saved from eternal condemnation? How can we be saved from the wrath and death that we deserve? God has provided, once again, the great object of our salvation. Now, Jesus treats this snake as a Christological type. Now, we've gone through Colossians. We've gone through Hebrews. If you've been here with us some time, so you understand what types are. But just a kind of a brief explanation. A Christological type is a person, an object, an animal, or event that points to the greater person and work of the coming Christ or the coming Messiah. So we call that a Christological type. As we covered earlier, the lamb is a very easy one, right? We see the lamb portrayed often there in the Old Testament, but then John announces uh, the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. This is what that was pointing to. So you look at types as something that's teaching uh, us about the Messiah and his work. Now, as with other types, these types are limited. They don't exhaust the person and work of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because they're not God. All right, so they are designed to teach something. It's a type, uh, as Colossians uh, 2, 15 through 17 says, uh, a shadow in the substance. So you can look at this theologically. You often read books or something, and they'll say type and anti-type. In that situation, type is the snake. The anti-type or the non-type would be Jesus. Same thing with the lamb. The lamb is the type. The anti-type would be Jesus. Uh, Paul uses the word shadow and substance, okay? Uh, it's, it's elevated, it's more. Jesus is the substance. Now, this snake uh, was the exclusive object of salvation if they wanted to live. Now, we're going to see this in just a moment, how Jesus brings this all back to himself. But before we do, I want to exhaust this serpent. And he is this serpent, the bronze serpent, is mentioned one other time in Scripture. This is not necessarily having to do with the sermon today. It's a bonus. You get a bonus today, all right? Look at 2 Kings 18, verse 3 through 4. Uh, this, this, the fiery serpent is not mentioned again. Really, you have this event there in Numbers. Then you have Jesus bring it up again. But over in uh, 2 Kings, we have an interesting historical note about that fiery serpent. Because Israel did what Israel likes to do. And they like to make idols, and uh, they like to commit idolatry. And they did this uh, quite often. And this is what they chose to do with the fiery serpent that God had commanded them to make. So if you look at 2 Kings 18, verse 3 through 4, you have a king here who's now doing things right. Look at verse 3. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nahushtan. Now, this is the fiery serpent, the bronze fiery serpent that God had commanded Moses to make. But what are the people doing? Uh, they're making offerings to this snake, uh, to the fiery serpent. Now, why would it be sinful for the people of Israel to give offerings to the bronze snake that had been sent by God. Uh, basically, really easily, 
is easy. It's not God, okay? It is a hunk, a chunk of metal, and that's it. Uh, God had told them to make this. They made this, but it is not supposed to be worshipped. They were rejecting God by creating this idol and worshiping and sending, giving offerings to this idol. And that is the problem. You see this repeated over and over with Israel. I mean, even when they come out of Israel, all the supernatural signs, miracles, and wonders, uh, the, the God descending on the mountain, Moses going up, and what do they do? Oh, you know what? Let's make a golden idol and worship this calf. That's after everything they've been through. And this is repeated over and over and over. But it's not just Israel. It's humanity in general. If you think of even the time of the Reformation, one of the big problems that, that Luther pointed out was that there was reliquaries everywhere. That is just a collection of holy relics. Uh, you think of it as a museum. And all the various kingdoms, all the various nations had them. Of course, Rome had the largest collection but you could pay your money and you could go into the reliquary and you could see all the remnants, all the holy relics of old, supposedly. But there were like something like 2,000 heads of John the Baptist on display. And that biologically doesn't make sense, right? There's only one of those. So you have, you have all this multitude of bones and frag little fragments of the cross and this and that that people would go to. They would, they would pray to, they would say the Hail Mary, they would say the Lord's Prayer, they would earn points off purgatory by doing these things. And one of the things that the Reformation brought about was the annihilation, the destruction of these things. It's like, no, we worship God, and we don't need to go to relics, we don't need to go to statues of saints to do anything. You can pray, you can talk to God right now, right where you're at, anywhere, whatever you're doing. Uh, but here, Israel takes this serpent, and instead of saying, thank you, God, for rescuing us, for saving us, we worship you, they turn it into an idol. Now, um, look at verse 16 of John chapter 3. Turn back to John chapter 3. So Jesus makes this comparison to the snake, uh, to himself. And that leads us into verse 16. Very few people draw this in, but it's important to do it because you see how easily it ties in together. That's why this, this sermon should be with. A lot of people start a sermon at 16, but that's really interrupting the flow of John. Uh, go back to verse 14. So he says here in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So this verse is flowing from 14 and 15 to show that the, God gave the snake to Israel, right? So they might be physically saved. Now God has given the world his only son for eternal salvation. And, and this is what we're seeing when, the, when a type is used or a shadow is used and further explained. You always see types pointing to something greater. And that is what we see being between this bronze uh, serpent and Christ. You see the shadow pointing towards the substance, the type pointing towards this, this anti-type, the, the fuller uh, revelation of God. Here's three key points that we see in this analogy, all right, um, between these two, the type and the anti-type, the shadow and the substance, the snake and Christ here. Uh, number one, the recipients of grace have become much greater in number, and that can be easily seen here. Uh, originally, you have the Israelites and only the Israelites that are being bitten by this snake. God gives them grace. If they look at that snake, they are cleansed from the poison, and their life is saved. Here, Jesus is elevating that. Types always go up. Now, God has given the world this object of salvation. And this is, this is that, that John uses the word world a lot. You kind of be careful what you're reading into when he says the word world. But here, this is, this use of the word world here means without distinction, I mean, more particularly without ethnic distinction. And you see that over in chapter 1, where he came to the Jews, the, his own people, they rejected him, and now it's to everyone, right? Same thing here. He, he, the object of salvation was given to the Jews there. They looked to the snake now. God has given grace to the world without ethnic distinction, not just the Israelites. And so this, the recipients of grace have become much greater in number. Salvation has come not just to the Jews, but to 
to Gentile, to the Gentile world as well. This is, again, you see this worked out in, um, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, where John introduces again Jesus as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of... What does he say? Does he say the Israelites? Does he say the Jews? No, he says to the world. It's without ethnic distinction now that Jesus has come into the world to save, all right? Originally, we see that lamb, as Jeff has explained, back in the Passover in Egypt, uh, the Israelites put the blood on the door, and God's wrath passed over the Israelites. So now, the lamb of God has come to save the world, take away the sins of the world, Again, this word, word world is used without ethnic distinction, okay? Now, uh, there is some trouble that sometimes people have with John 3.16. And I'm just going to list a couple of them to think through quickly. Uh, some people emphasize the first part of John 3.16, isolate it from the rest of the passage and context uh, to falsely presume upon the love of God. And we often, this is, this is a huge mistake we have today in looking at the attributes of God. Uh, a lot of times we'll re people will remove all the attributes of God, how God has revealed himself, his character, and just, just give him love. And that's all, that God is just a big, big love ball. And that's, that's all that's, that there is of him, right? A big care bear in the sky with love across his chest. or, or what it's just, like They just give him this one attribute. But that's not all that God is. And this verse is often used and memorized for such a thing. And this is sometimes the reason, or they will reason. They'll say something like, God loves the world. I am a part of the world. Therefore, God loves me. And oftentimes you'll see this, this false uh, theological presumption on that verse. Is this what John is teaching? This is not what John is teaching. And this is why context is so important. It's important to, to, even when we're teaching and preaching here from the Church of Pecan Creek, we're going through the scriptures. Why is that? Because the best way to understand verse 16, as you've seen, is to understand verse 15 and understand verse 14, and so it goes on. And so if you just look back at John chapter 3, and you would easily come to the conclusion that this is not the case. And if you just read past where we're going to, as we're going into in a moment, we read that this, that everyone is not salvifically loved by God. And this, this verse is often used to say that God loves everyone and that everyone is going to receive his eternal love. Not the case. And we'll find out more about that as we continue. A second point, some will choose this verse to teach the autonomy of man. That is, that, it, that we are self-made, our free will, freedom of the will, you might say. This would be the Arminian argument or semi-Pelagian argument. Uh, but by reading the entire chapter, literally just go back up, start at verse 1 and read down to this, you quickly see that this is not what John is teaching here. He literally says, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again? And what does Jesus say? The Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. And it blow, as the wind blows, so, blow, so goes the Holy Spirit. You cannot tell the wind what to do. Uh, we just saw a massive hur uh, tornado there in Arkansas a few weeks back, not personally, but on TV. But that thing's rolling through, right? Uh, can you just walk out and say, tornado, go that way instead of this way? You know, no. You're going to get sucked up in the tornado and be gone. We can't do that. Why? Because we don't have control over the wind. And the point Jesus is making is, just as we have no control over the wind, we have no control over the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, and God is sovereign and does not need the counsel of man to go where it wants to go. So we see in context, you read the whole, cha whole chapter 3, I think both of those are ruled out quickly. Now, let's move on. Another way that the uh, types and antitypes, shadow and substance, are compared here. Number two, the object of salvation has become greater. Uh, God gave an inanimate bronze, fiery serpent, snake, to be put on a pole, which, by the way, you see that often in the medical field still to this day. Uh, that's been carried over. Uh, you see that, that symbol there, if you've ever wondered why that came to be. But you see this inanimate hunk of metal, right? But now, what has God sent? God has sent his son, God in the flesh, for salvation. What is greater than this? 
Now we're not talking about a hunk of bronze metal. We're talking about the one who spoke the universe into existence, who created life itself, who has life in himself. God has sent Jesus, the Son of God, to uh, the, the greatest, greatest object of salvation there ever could be. So again, we see this type over here, bronze snake, you look and you live. Now the Son of God, God in the flesh. Number three, uh, the salvation is much greater. The Israelites who looked at the snake, the poison stopped coursing through their veins, and they were healed. Again, this supernatural act of God, right? They lived, but guess what? They eventually died still. So that was meant to save their physical life. But uh, salvation from the Son of God, as verse, the cha verse uh, chapter 316 uh, points out, is for eternity. It is eternal life. Uh, Jesus gives life eternal, defeats death, removes the curse of sin, provides eternal salvation. The greatest thing mankind needs is not to be saved from physical death, but the eternal wrath of God for our sins. So we see this elevation, right? So God, Jesus says, like the snake, there's a similarity there. Uh, God has now sent me. Uh, the salvation is greater. The audience is bigger. The, object, the, the salvation he brings is greater. Is a better object of salvation. Everything is greater with this typology. All right? Now, don't forget, all of this is connected to Look at uh, John chapter 3, verse 8 there. John chapter 3, verse 8. It's all going back to this, this, these, this dialogue that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. Look at verse 8. Um, and, well, go on back up. Let's see, let's see. Look at, look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is, and here's the great comparison, with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So with this passage, we see that the Holy Spirit is going to move upon someone to birth them again, to regenerate them, to give them a new heart, but it is not a, a empty or vacuous birthing again. Regeneration is not empty. There are effects of the Holy Spirit working upon someone's life. If, the, if you see trees that are blowing and leaves are doing this, uh, leaves are moving, trees are moving, uh, you hear things in the air moving, you see leaves moving, what is happening at that time? Wind is blowing, right? Uh, you can't tell the wind what to do, but you can see the effects of the wind. And it really looks like Jesus is saying here, you can't tell the Holy Spirit what to do, but you will see the effects of the Holy Spirit upon someone's life. If you look back at John 3.16, uh, what effect of the Holy Spirit moving upon a person's life is mentioned? It, it seems like or there's a right belief in Jesus as the Son of God. Like this is flowing from what J J Jesus has just mentioned up here about the Holy Spirit moving. Right belief, correct belief in Jesus Christ is crucial and necessary for salvation. And this right belief doesn't even come about in and of ourselves. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, By faith you have been saved, and this is not your own doing, right? So who, this is all part of God's Holy Spirit working upon a believer's life, causing them to have right belief, okay? So we definitely see that effect there. We also saw back in John, uh, look at 2.23, where all belief is not right belief. Uh, oftentimes, John chapter 6, John chapter 2 here, uh, at multiple places where John mentions the word belief or they believed, but yet it's not saving faith. It's not saving belief. Uh, 2.23, look what he says. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But then in verse 24 and verse 25, we see that that's not true saving faith. They saw him performing the signs. They believed something about Jesus, 
But it was not that he was the son of God sent to them to save them. And so he turned away from them. He knew it was in their hearts and he left them. All right. So that is not true belief. But one effect of the Holy Spirit working upon someone's life is a right belief in God, uh, in Jesus Christ particularly, that he is indeed uh, fully God. Now, uh, critical to saving faith is the right belief that Jesus is God. John 20, verse 31, if you want to hold your place there and flip over to John 20, verse 31. And we'll mention this verse a lot because it is the purpose statement of the book of John. Uh, sometimes you have, a, have books in the Bible that really narrow it down to a central purpose statement. And John is one of those. And in John 20, 31, he says why these things are written, right? He says, but these are written, why? Here it is. So that you may believe in the, in the correct Jesus Christ, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. So this is, this is the purpose statement that John is writing that to explain who Jesus is so that people may know, so that they may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And all along the, the Old Testament, God has been prophesying that he was going to send this one object of salvation, the Messiah, the Christ. And John is saying you must believe that he is the Christ. Similar to the, the, the snake episode there, there's only one way of salvation, only one object of salvation, but this is the Christ, and there in verse 31, that he is the Son of God. So we find that similarity there in John 3, 16 as well. It's flowing from, what does it look like when the Holy Spirit blows? What does it look like when the Holy Spirit moves upon someone's life? Right belief is a product of, that, of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 17. Uh, back to John chapter 3. John 3 verse 17. He continues on. He says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And this we see the, the primary purpose of Jesus coming to the world was to save sinners. You perhaps could still be, he could still be drawing from the analogy of the snake, why did God send the snake to Moses, to the Israelites? It wasn't to condemn, it was to save, to all those who looked, right? Uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul summarizes the purpose of Jesus coming as this, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is why God the Son has put on flesh, came to live, came to die, to save sinners. This is the purpose that he has come. There will be an ultimate judgment, we find out. Again, God is not just love, and that's it. He is perfectly righteous. He's perfectly holy. He will be the final judge over all mankind, and that specific judge is going to be God the Son. But the purpose Jesus has come, similar to the snake, is to save. It is for, the, for those who believe, right? Look at verse 18, John chapter 3. Whoever believes in him is not condemned... But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So here we have this exclusiveness again. Uh, there was a snake. Look at the snake, the only one, right? Same with G this John 3.16 is folding into 17 and 18 here. There's only one Son of God. You must believe in this object of salvation in order to be saved. If not, what does it mean? Well, it means far worse than falling dead from snake poison in your veins. It means that you are condemned. The natural status of mankind is condemnation. Uh, the natural status of mankind is remaining in sin. We are sinful. Ephesians chapter 2 lists all these things out. We follow the course of this world. We do what our mind and our body wants. We try to be autonomous, set up our own rules. We follow after Satan, follow after the sons of disobedience. We are by nature object of God's wrath. By nature objects of God's wrath. So we are by nature objects of condemnation. So look at verse uh, chapter, I'm oh, sorry, go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. What does this mean for us who believe in Jesus Christ? 
for salvation, it means that we are not condemned. It means that our sins have been forgiven. The curse has been lifted. The wrath has been lifted. As people were snake bitten and looked to the bronze serpent on the pole and the poison left their veins, they were rejoicing. They were celebrating. They were so happy, right? They were so joyful and they're worshiping God. Their condemnation is no more. Uh, but Jesus brings something even greater in this salvation. He removes the eternal condemnation. Look at Romans 8, verse 1. And uh, I'm going to skip from verse 1. Pay attention to this all the way to verse 31 and 34, just for this particular sermon, okay? Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is huge. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is huge. Now go to verse 31. He expands upon this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who did, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. This is tremendous. I mean, you take this over in, in, in a great cross-reference to John 3, 18. Everyone who believes in Jesus is not condemned and you never will be condemned. Your condemnation, the poison that flows through your veins, the wrath and curse that you deserve for your sins has been and will be ultimately removed because of the object of your faith is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, who will not be saved, according to John 3.18? Look back at 3.18. Uh, those who do not believe, uh, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Uh, this, this is who will not be saved. Those who do not believe in God's Savior, think about this, are living in condemnation right now, but will finally and ultimately be condemned to eternal punishment for their sins. And even today, if, if you are here or listening today and you're not believing in God's object of salvation, then you are in condemnation. Uh, the old prison term used to be if a person was uh, in, for, in and to be executed soon and they're walking down the hallways, it was dead man walking and because they're alive but they're on their way to be executed, right? I mean, he's alive, he's walking, he's moving, he can talk, he, he's eating a last meal, but he's as good as dead. That condemnation is moments away. So it is with those who do not believe in God's object of salvation. The poison is still in their veins. Every sin they have ever been committed is still upon them. They will die in their sin, or what the Bible says, with their sin, and they will face God in judgment one day. They're living in condemnation, and they will go into ultimate and eternal condemnation as well. The good news is, again, the gospel is good news, God has sent the greatest object of salvation, his son, to look to for salvation, and that condemnation is removed. Look at verse 19, John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the judgment... The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And this, this verse 19 plays again back on chapter 1 where Jesus is presented with lots of different titles, but he is life. He is the, has the life of men in himself. He is the creator of all life. He is the light as well. And here you have this verse that says the light has come into the world. But the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Now, why do people not come to the light of Christ, according to this verse? John says because they love darkness more. I mean, they, they, the light is there, the, but they love darkness. And it's not a literal darkness. Here we're talking about sin. They love living in their sin more than they love coming to the light seeing their sin truthful as God does, and coming for salvation. Uh, coming to the light exposes sinfulness. So you think of 
sinfulness. You think of darkness and, and living against God's will. And yet God has provided the cure here, but yet they desire to stay in their sin. People don't come to God because they love their sin more than they love God, right? In fact, you see as you read the Bible, it's not that they love sin and love God and just love sin a little bit more. But as we see as we'll go through the book of John, they hate God, the real God. They absolutely hate God. Jesus, the real Jesus, and they'll often create a false God that they say they love him, but it's not the real God, right? So they love their sin, and they want to do what they want to do in this life, and they will do it at all costs, even if it means to hate God. Um, there is a tremendous effect, uh, a difference uh, between an unbeliever and a believer who sins. Uh, the unbeliever justifies their sin often creates a false god who approves of their sin, glories in their sin, and encourages others to sin as well. Uh, we find this multiple places in the Bible. But turn with me to Romans 1, verse 29 through 32. You'll see an example of that. Romans 1, 29 through 32. And I really think, as you read John 3, uh, he is laying out that there, there are effects of the Holy Spirit moving, and one of them is right belief. Another one is, is that you do come to the truth. You see sin as God sees sin. You see yourself as a sinner. You come to the light that exposes your sin. You're not staying in the darkness. And all this, all this is talking about is true confession. And when you sin... You are to confess that sin to God. That means the same speak of it as God speaks of that sin. Not justifying it, not blaming it on others, but con true confession. You've come to the truth. You've let letting the light of Christ expose you as a sinner who needs salvation. So the Holy Spirit is moving in his life. How can a man be born again? Jesus doesn't say, give him the answer to do this, do that, then you'll be born again. He says the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. Uh, God does what God does, uh, but you will see the effects. People will believe correctly. They will have true faith. They will also repent of their sin and confess of their sin. But here in Romans 1.29, you see, you see how unbelievers treat sinfulness. They're not ashamed of it. They're not, they don't hate their sin. They love their sin. They bask in their sin. They have parades and parties about their sin and invite everyone to join in on their sin. And if you don't like their sin or approve of their sin, you are uh, the sinner now. All right? This has been going on today, of course, but it's been going on forever. Look at 29 through 32. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's de righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is a person who is not born again. All right? This is the opposite. But not only do they participate in all this sinful activity, but they encourage it and they approve of it. They brag about it and try to get others to do the same thing that they are doing. The believer who sins, a person who has been born again, who, who has been regenerated by God, has a, been gifted with a supernatural recreation of your desires, which now you hate your sin because you love God. And when you sin, it hurts you. You don't like it. You don't, even though you have sinned, what are you going to do? You're going to confess. You are going to repent of that sin. And we consider, Dave, I think David's a great, great one to look to uh, on this. Turn over to Psalm 32, verse 1 through 5. Again, more could be read on this, but we're just going to do verses 1 through 5. Psalm 32, 1 through 5. David had sinned. He committed horrible sins, right? He had, he had taken someone else's wife. He had committed adultery. He had taken that man basically out and, uh, and, and, and murdered him. Uh, you could call it second-degree murder possibly, but, but David was the one uh, that, that oversaw that and had that done. 
He had committed horrible, egregious sins against God. And he hid that sin, right? And he didn't confess that sin. Finally, Nathan the prophet comes to him and calls him out on it. And David, David fully confesses of this sin, repents from that sin, and he turns from it. But this is written as David is, is writing about what was going on inside of him as he had committed this and was holding this and not confessing of his sin. Look at verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, this is David, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This is, even though it took David a long time, we don't want to do that, but the, here you see that it was, he was wrecked inside when he kept silent, when he wouldn't confess, when he wouldn't turn. It was wasting away, groaning all day. His strength was dried up as in the heat of the summer. Last summer, 110 degrees, right? You go to your mailbox, come back, you need a Gatorade. It's like, it was horrible. Uh, and here, you, he just, he's, he's withering. It's emotional, it's spiritual, it's physical, and that is a wrecking of a person who is a believer who's living in sin. They are torn apart on the inside. But what happens? He confesses, verse 5. He, open, he confesses this sin. He turns from that sin and, and it, see that it, it is forgiven now through Jesus, through, through, through God's mercy, through his grace, through ultimately Jesus Christ, who dies for David's sin and dies for our sin as well. Now, David's sin caused him great pain and agony. And if you know the story, uh, he put up a good front and faked it to everyone, but yet he was miserable on the inside. When he came to the light, he came to the truth, he was exposed to the righteousness of God, confessed, and rested in the forgiveness of God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ has come to die for the sinners. Now, in summary, as we look at this, um, you definitely want to see that verse 14 flows into verse 16 as well, right? And the great similarity that is put forth there. Uh, Moses has sent the serpent. God sent this object of salvation to Moses. He put it up. All those who have been bitten by the poisonous snake look to it. They are saved. Jesus uses that analogy, that type, to show that God has now sent him to Jesus, who is God in the flesh. The audience is much greater. It's not just the Israelites. Now it's everyone who looks to the Son, will be saved. The object of salvation is greater. The audience is greater. The salvation that, that Jesus brings is, of course, far greater than this Numbers chapter 21 account. But also, as we go through that, the Holy Spirit, I think this is important, uh, like the wind, is impo it's important to acknowledge is out of our control. We don't make the Holy Spirit do what we want to do, and it has to do with regeneration, being saved. God is sovereign, he does not need our counsel, and he regenerates as he wants to regenerate. However, the effects of the wind are visible, and so are the effects of re regeneration by the Holy Spirit. A right belief in Jesus Christ, a right view of sin, confession of sin, and repentance from sin are brought about by the Holy Spirit. Uh, these are characteristics of one who will not perish, who is not condemned, who is not walking in darkness, but one who has eternal life, who will enter the kingdom of God. Remember, that's what this chapter is about. So you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Well, how can a person be born again? How can a person enter the kingdom of God, right? Uh, so, so that's what all of this is in the context of. Uh, those who walk in the light of truth and righteousness, this is uh, the, the, the blowing, you might say, of the Holy Spirit upon someone's life. Uh, if you have looked to Jesus Christ, there is wonderful rest today that you are not condemned. You, the poison has been stopped. You have eternal life. You have salvation through Jesus Christ. 
This is huge. It is tremendous. And if you are seeing Jesus as the Christ, the exclusive, the one and only way to heaven, if you're not creating a different idol, right, but you're believing in the Jesus of the Bible, if you're seeing that he is the Son of God, if you see your sin and you hate your sin and you're confessing and you're repenting of your sin, then this is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And we rest in the fact that we have been born again. And as the Israelites, who were cured from the poison, rejoiced greatly, uh, we should rejoice greatly that our condemnation has been lifted, salvation has been provided through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the greatest object of salvation, uh, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, has come to live the perfect righteous life that we could not live. Uh, he was put on a cross. He became the curse for us, that who all, whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Lord, we thank you that we can rest assured, knowing for certain that we have eternal life. God, we thank you for working in our lives to bring about salvation. Lord, we pray for anyone who has not, uh, not turned to Jesus Christ for salvation, that you would work upon them, draw them to yourself, even today. May they see the beauty of this good news, the beauty of the gospel. May they come to the light and may their sinfulness be exposed. May their sins be exposed as David was trying to hide that sin but openly confessed and rested in your forgiveness. May it be for them and be for us as well, Lord. May we confess our sin. May we turn to Jesus and see that he is the one and only object of salvation that has been sent out of your love not that we have done anything to earn this or deserve this or work for this, but because you have loved, you have sent your son for our salvation, that the condemnation will be removed, the curse lifted, the wrath removed, and that we can have the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to us so that we can rest assured that we do have eternal life, not eternal death, that we have salvation, not condemnation, and that we will be with you as we looked at the Lord's Supper today, we will rejoice and we'll celebrate. There will be wonderful joy as we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb one day. And we are in the new heavens and new earth that we're guaranteed because of the great salvation that has come through Jesus Christ.